Hello and welcome to my advanced digital marketing course, Strategy and Execution. I am Imad Shukair. Chapter 5 is very, very interesting and exciting and useful, as it includes both marketing and sales, planning and management. So if you are into marketing, if you are into sales, if you are into business development, if you are into management, if you are a whatever role you have at the personal level, you are planning to start a business, this can be very helpful for you to plan for your marketing and sales together. We have a very good agenda for today's chapter. And as I do at the beginning of every chapter, I cover a little bit of the technology I use in the production of this course. Today, I will speak about the video editing software I use in the production of this video. And what can be exciting as well is I'm going to be using a different uh, video editing software from the one I've used in the previous four chapters. Which two softwares I'm using? They are very special and they are very much famous. The first one uh, I learned is Adobe Premiere Pro. Adobe Premiere is very known for its very intensive and comprehensive set of features. It's very, very massive. Even many movies are produced using uh, or, or edited using Adobe Premiere. So today I will edit this video using Apple Final Cut Pro. Now, the Final Cut Pro on the new MacBook Pro with M1 chips is super, super amazing and fast, uh, you know. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Adobe Premiere is not as, as good uh, or as fast as uh, Final Cut Pro, but Final Cut is more optimized for the new Mac uh, introduced by Apple recently, which is I showed you in the previous videos, which is the with the M1. I have the one with the M1 Max processor. So with some additional uh, visual effects uh, I have bought on top of the uh, Final Cut Pro, I hope this video you're going to see some something very much more exciting a little bit uh, okay added to your to the transitions so without me showing you a demonstration which I promise I will show you in the future videos a comparison between Adobe Premiere and and Final Cut Pro which you have maybe uh, I don't exert maybe millions of videos on YouTube about this subject but I will try to show you my my experience on using uh, both before any further uh, delays, uh, let's get into the chapter five of the course. Our agenda for chapter five is I will uh, review together uh, chapter four, uh, and then we go and speak about very important definitions, because if you are into marketing, uh, we must have very clear understanding of each of the following terms. Uh, buyers' personas, prospects, contacts, leads, opportunities, customers, sales funnel. And one more I will just add indirectly is accounts, which is companies. Okay. After that, we cover the marketing-driven business first versus sales-driven business. And then we cover in details the marketing and sales alignment, forecasting, and target settings. The agenda for uh, the entire course, as you can see here, we are in chapter five. And uh, after chapter five, next chapter will be very interesting because it will be the heart of the course. So chapter six will be about the fundamentals of marketing strategic planning. So in chapter six, we will learn how to produce the marketing strategic document okay, for our business. And part two, as we can see here, part one is about the fundamentals of strategic marketing. So part one covers the strategy of marketing, the planning and the strategy. And part two will cover the building of the digital marketing machine, which has those five chapters from seven to 11. Uh, each one, we cover the digital marketing tools or the marketing tools in general that are used to automate each stage of the customer life cycle. And I cover those in details in every chapter. Chapter 12 will be the course summary and <clears throat> review. Let's get started. What did we cover in the last chapter? Last chapter was very important uh, and we spoke about the customer uh, journey. How many stages are in the customer journey? Mainly three. They are awareness, consideration, and decision. We spoke last week, okay, because I published the video last week, 
about the customer journey is from the perspective of the buyer. So it's not from the perspective of us being marketing professionals trying to uh, classify the stages of the customer. So it is from the perspective of the customer, the customer or the prospects being aware of a problem they might have. And then after that, they consider a solution for that problem and they make a decision to buy a product. During the entire process, okay, which is the customer journey process, okay, we are in the middle and we influence it and we drive the entire thing and then we, of course, close it by selling our product to the client. An example of uh, awareness, because it's always important for you to understand and differentiate between the customer journey versus the marketing methodology, which is the four stages of the customer life cycle. And this is what we covered also last week is when you put, for example, uh, an advertisement saying, are you tired from driving all the time? And then people will click to read your article. And when they read your article, you speak about how can be very much convenient and many people appointing drivers instead of buying their buying two cars for a certain house, buying one car, etc. So you are driving uh, people to read about an option they might have in their life that can help them solve a problem of buying two cars and maintaining two cars into buying one car as an example and appointing a driver because what does your company do? They subcon you subcontract drivers. So you see, this is how do you, you can drive a conversation from the perspective of the customer side. And of course, positioning what you do to the into the market uh, from the perspective of uh, you know of, uh, of the customer uh, issues and helping the clients or your prospects get uh, better uh, you know uh, in their way of life by buying your products. If you haven't uh, watched chapter four, I urge you to do that because it's very important. Before chapter four, of course, we covered chapter three, which was in detail about the four stages of the customer life cycle, which you must master, not only remember, what are the four stages of the customer life cycle? Brand awareness, customer engagement, customer conversions, and customer retention. So this is a splitting your entire sales pipeline or marketing and sales pipeline into four stages. One is the brand awareness, customer engagement, customer conversion, and customer retention. You are into marketing and you are going into an interview for a marketing job. If you make a single little mistake showing that you don't understand the clearly each of those terms, you will never get the job. This is if your person is interviewing you is, is up to speed on, on those terminologies. And not only that, these are very good. So if you have this common understanding inside your organization about what each one of those means, uh, this will help you really have a, a, a proper taxonomy within your organization is when you say this is a buyer's persona, this is a, this, this is a client, this is a prospect, this is a contact, so you, this is a lead, this is an opportunity. So you will have a very clear referral to what, what is meant by that uh, keyword or by that terminology. So let's cover each of those uh, you know, uh, uh, important uh, terms and uh, then cover the core part of the marketing and sales planning and management because these are essential for you to, to really understand. What is a buyer's persona? A lot of marketing professionals who are into business, they may say, well, we understand who buys our clients. Uh, this is the list. In fact, we have it and we know why they are buying our product. Okay, I don't want to disagree with that, but I do assume that the majority of organizations don't have a very 100% clear understanding of, of why clients buy their products. So again, it's very important for you, whether you know or you don't know, is to keep digging into understanding who really buys your product, because understanding that is a very, very key element in, in having you properly or efficiently targeting your right prospects um, and increasing the return on your marketing investment. If you know your business, you should know your potential buyers. And this is what I wanted to say is that this is really shows how much you understand your entire business. Do one to three personas per product slash service group, right? So if you have a set of products, this is why if you have so many products in your portfolio, it is important to understand that not only one persona might fit 
your products, but multiple personas. Document your buyer's personas, write them down, you know, try to explain them. I think very few companies really do that. And where do you put those documentations about your buyer's personas? Of course, is in your marketing strategy plan is when you list your products, there will be a section where you list for every product, what are the typical buyers personas. And I want to add here, it's important to write the keywords that you use to communicate with your buyers personas. I covered the emotional versus rational part. So this is why here you might say uh, this product, uh, one buyer's persona is uh, related to the emotional part and another one related to rational part. So you might see them as two different personas. Example is I sell uh, real estate units. You know, some clients buy from my project uh, because it is an amazing experience living over there. And some people might buy uh, that uh, because it's very close to the metro. So you see here, there is the practical, the rational part, and there is the emotional part, which is related to the experience, feelings, etc. Sometimes the experience is even better, the emotional part, because at the emotion, when the emotions are engaged, money becomes less relevant. This is what we spoke about in last chapter. Great. So if you are into business to business or business to consumer, the persona, of course, will be different because you are speaking about people in here and here talking about businesses. So some sample examples about the uh, criteria for a buyer's persona for a customer who is a consumer. Uh, it, is the gen it is the gender. This is a mistake here. Occupation, nationality, demography, social status, income. And these are just the basics. And it could be many other products slash services. Example is psychological background. This does not only help you in targeting, but it helps you in the engagement with the clients when your salespeople are talking to clients. This is very, very key because you can leverage it more intelligently and close more of your sales opportunities when you are engagement, engaging with the clients. Business profiles. Here we can speak about industry, company size, revenue, company type, whether government, private sector or public or non-for-profit local or international, the location of the company. And as I explained, is these are the core, but there can be many, many other criteria that talk about the, or describe what a buyer's persona. Again, uh, knowing your buyer's persona, it's a very good indication that you know your business. So if you don't know who could be your uh, personas, eh, go back to uh, studying uh, more about your business. Okay, prospects, hmm. slightly easier. <laughs> okay, so your prospects are your targeted potential customers, simple. If you are into business to business as an example and you sell medical equipments to hospitals and you are in a certain country, you are operating in a country. So practically speaking, you can say there are 2000 hospitals in our country and this is my list of prospects. But if you are into B2C, sometimes the list of prospects is hard. Uh, to gather because it's so massive. Now, what is the relationship between buyer's persona or the persona and the prospect? Of course, the prospects are uh, your uh, subset or, or the people or the organizations that uh, when you compile the criteria of the buyer's personas, you should accurately get the list of prospects or the set of prospects you have for your business. All right, so you decide on your prospects based on identifiers, buyers, person, right? And the number of prospects can be relatively minor or very large depending on your, on your business. To effectively and efficiently target your prospects, okay, you have to know how to reach them. So why do we care about uh, knowing exactly where and how uh, many are our prospects is of course to be able to plan a proper marketing strategy that enables us to reach into those prospects. Contacts, it looks simple, but uh, let's define what a contact is. Uh, so this is what we refer to them as your business contacts. Normally they are people, of course. It can be a prospect, it can be a partner, it can be a, you know, a candidate for a member, it can be, so here where when we store contacts, we call those business contacts, it can be a list of competitors because you can display advertisements for your competitors. Oh, 
who does the, who, the, who does that? Yeah, the means innovations and marketing is very key. So the question here: If I store 500 people and I have their emails in my database, can I display advertisements? So we're going to see this in the next part of the course. But can I display advertisement for those 500 people? Uh, of course, you can take the list, update it to, uh, for example, uh, Facebook. If you want to display advertisement for them on Facebook, you can upload the, upload the list to Facebook and then you can tell Facebook, advertise to those people, please. Okay. And also you can tell Facebook, advertise to those people and select based on artificial intelligent algorithms, similar people also and advertise to them. So that's why storing contacts in your database and segmenting them is very key for your uh, business. Okay, and you can, of course, store the entire set of attributes about every contact, like, uh, you know, example, job function, uh, job title, seniority level, uh, <coughs> age, etc., etc. Well, great. So always uh, a good business is the, is the business that has uh, a very large contact database. Uh, don't buy contact databases, uh, you know, because if you obtain a database list, uh, it could be that you're not allowed to store it. Uh, be careful. Uh, or uh, it might be not your prospects. So you just uh, email people without or try to reach people where they will not give you much of uh, proper return. What is a lead? A lead is usually a contact, so it's a person interested in your products or services. So leads go through various stages, as you will see, including uh, critical stages such as marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads. Leads count in your marketing demand performance, but not in your sales forecast. Remember this very well, because when I show you, you know, the pipeline, you need to remember. So if you want to measure how much of marketing you have achieved, you count leads. But if you know how much business you might be closing, you add up your sales funnel, which counts for all your opportunities. We're going to see this in the next slide. So when you have leads stored in your marketing system, uh, you need to nurture them so that they can mature and qualify. And this is what the entire field of marketing automation is about. What is an opportunity? Hmm, interesting. An opportunity is a qualified lead. I'm going to give you now very exact uh, you know, criteria to help you know when a lead is an becomes an opportunity. Okay, so an opportunity is a person or a company ready to buy from you or your competitors. So let's give an example to illustrate what an opportunity is. All right. Assume uh, you are into uh, you are you work in a showroom and then your job is to sell cars. One person walks into your showroom, okay, and he or she is looking into a car. And then you come to the person uh, and then you try, "Hi, sir, how are you? Uh, it seems you are having a nice time looking at our beautiful new model, etc." And the person is saying, uh, yeah, that's okay. And then you say uh, to the person, uh, can I have your contact? So first of all, uh, get the contact of the person. When you get the contact now, okay, uh, you secure that you have a contact, okay? After that, uh, you know, uh, okay, you might ask the person a question. Um, are you aware about this new model? Uh, so the person might tell you, well, uh, yeah, I mean, because I saw it on the internet, this is the new 2022 model, uh, and I'm keen to really see it. So I I came by here to have a look at the new car. So now what, you, what in your dictionary, what you have got is a lead, right? Because the person is interested in the car. Is this person an opportunity? Not yet, but let's see how we can qualify if this person is an opportunity or not. Don't forget, if you go to the four stages of the customer life cycle, brand awareness is already done, right? Customer engagement is what's happening now, okay? And then after customer engagement, there will be the conversion, which is when, we, when he or she buys the car. But let's see now we are still in the, in, in the process of engagement. And then you ask the person here, uh, what car do you drive right now? So you see, I'm not trying to push the person first to try the car as a test drive unless uh, I read some signs on the person that tells me this person is suitable to buy the car. 
So you see here, I have two options, whether to, to engage on a person first to make the person drive the car first, because this has a tremendous benefit as well. You know, the benefit is uh, if the person does not buy even the car or does not come back, at least I leave an impression with the person about how good my car is. But there is a cost for that because if they test the drive, you know, it has a cost associated with it. So I don't want to push everyone who comes into our showroom into a test drive. But the question which is important than the test drive is I ask the person because I want to qualify whether this is an opportunity or not. I ask the person, what car do you drive now, sir? And here where the answer, you see, so where the answer can be an amazing opportunity for me to know whether this is an opportunity or not. So I may receive an answer like, well, uh, I had um, a uh, Mercedes S series last week. I had a small accident and it became old anyway, so I sold it. And now I'm without a car looking for a new car. All right, so the, the guy's answer is very obvious that this is an opportunity, all right? But however, I encourage you as salespeople is not to stop here as well, because a lot of salespeople based on a sign, you know, they assume and they go there and they put this is an opportunity, very top priority because the, car, the guy does not have a car planning to buy a car within a week. Right. So I continue and ask the last question, which will make it so obvious. So you are planning to buy a car this week or I may mean, say like so oh so you have a mission to buy a new car within one or two weeks and then you might get a surprise oh no 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 because I already bought a car six months back and it was due for delivery etc and then you say the entire thing might completely change that this guy is not even a lead now anymore because he ordered an electrical car from Tesla as an example he was waiting six months for the delivery and he's just passing during the showroom because he's like feeling nostalgic to look at cars. But he has no intention at all to buy from you a new car, you know. So you see, it is the questions, the conversation in a pleasant way, you know. And professionally speaking, uh, no harm. A lot of salespeople feel shy asking questions. Uh, when someone is into your showroom, don't assume that asking the person uh, a question might make them change their mind and leave the showroom. Of course, you should not interrupt their experiences if they are opening the door, trying to get into the car, etc. But during the right time, you have to engage with the clients the right way and asking them questions because your job is to sell, right? So this is very, very important. So this is how do you differentiate between what uh, an opportunity and and uh, and a lead. So what is an opportunity? An opportunity is a qualified lead is when the customer is into the buying vision and if the if the uh, if the person or the company will buy a solution whether from you or from your competitors within time frame like it could be one day or it could be two years no worries but at least we know that here there is some money on the table to be spent by uh, by a lead and that makes the lead an opportunity in the b2b when you receive a quotation from a client or request for a quotation from, from a company, this goes immediately into an opportunity because companies normally don't raise a request for a quotation unless they are uh, buying. So this is very important. All right. So anytime you submit a quotation, it is supposed to be what? An opportunity. Okay. Unless just, just you are sending the price list to someone just to have an idea about the price, which will keep it as. Why is this so important, as we're going to see in the next slide, to differentiate between leads and opportunities? When you forecast for sales, all right, all opportunities, because all, all opportunities count in the sales pipeline. All right. So this is why when it is an opportunity, you should know the value of the, the, of the opportunity. So <clears throat> if somebody walks into your showroom uh, looking at two cars, one for $100,000, one for $150,000, you're supposed to have a clearer idea about whether this person is going to go with this car or that car. But if you're completely confused, you can count the opportunity as 110, all right? Uh, because this will go into your sales revenue pipeline. And if the person buys the 150, no problem, uh, you get more revenue. If he buys the 100, you can adjust it at the time of closing the opportunity. Great. So I think we covered the opportunity and let's move forward to customers. Somebody might say, well, I mean, this is easy. A customer is, what is a customer? 
right? So I put this to emphasize on the point, which is a customer is not only the company or the person who already bought from you, okay? But it's so important to differentiate between those customers. Not all customers are alike or the same. Okay, so when you are closing a deal, selling a client uh, and that per company, etc., becomes a customer, part of the experience you should know whether this company is buying for the first time and the last time, or it will be the last time they buy from you, or there is, can be a very good potential for you to engage and put them on loyalty strategies so that you can maximize the relationship. And later on, you can engage with them on different projects and sell them more and more. All right. Normally, uh, selling existing customers or upselling, we call it, is very, very beneficiary for your organization because the next time they buy, they buy very fast. Very important part here, which is the segmentation of your clients, as I mentioned, uh, so that you can say these clients are... Uh, a lot of companies segment the clients based on the potential, not based on what they have bought already from you. So if you know, yeah, they bought a lot in the past, but they are less likely to buy anything in the future due to some reason. You know, they have a project and it's finished, or they and they are gonna not gonna be doing additional product, uh, additional projects anymore in the future. So you might put them as low, and if a new business is coming and you see, so segment them based on the priority. Okay. So let's come now to the sales funnel, or they refer to it as the sales pipeline. So it is a representation of your marketing and sales process for a specific line of product. Maybe this diagram is the must for you to understand when you are into marketing and sales. So the number of stages in the funnel should depend on the marketing and sales process. So do we go with this? Uh, do we go with the with this uh, number of stages in every uh, in every implementation? I implemented maybe not less than hundreds of customer relationship management solutions when I was even Microsoft and after I left. So I've been implementing CRM and marketing solutions for companies for the past 15, 20 years, you know. So normally your stages shouldn't be very long because at every stage here, you can have a sub process. All right. So this is why the, the normal of stages normally within a funnel are around five to maximum eight, you know. Uh, so use the steps and the funnel to plan the business targets and marketing and sales forecast as we're going to see in the next slides so let's get this into the sales funnel in, in in more details the funnel starts by targeting your what your buyers personas so if you know your buyers personas then you will be able to run a criteria and develop your list of prospects this list in some businesses, it can be so much uh, defined, uh, like these are the 200 prospects they are the, the, that we need to target. Or it can be uh, selected the criteria that uh, people with this age group, etc., etc., which can be a very unknown list. But uh, through marketing is very key is we will be able to reach uh, those uh, prospects, uh, you know, through various marketing channels. After we target the prospects, they show some interest, like the person who I worked into our uh, showroom. So I'll give you another example here. Uh, someone comes to your website, fills in a form saying, you know, would you please give me some more information about solution that you are introducing? All right. So what is this until now? It is a form submission. This means we have a lead. But that lead, do we just take it and give it to the salespeople? Normally, no, because salespeople time is more valuable. <laughs> Uh, or at least we want to be able to handle more to handle more uh, number of submissions you know so it depends on the size of business and how many form submissions you receive but the ideal process will be like this somebody from the marketing department will call the person say hi sir good morning i can see that uh, you have come to our website and uh, uh, you filled in a form showing interest uh, about uh, this specific solution we have. Oh, okay. May I know a little bit about, uh, you know, about you so that I can refer to you to the right person? And the conversation, I don't want to spend more time talking about this. So, and, and some conversation takes place by the marketing person to know whether this person, what, is buying something now or in the future. If they feel that this person is 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 qualified from a from a sales perspective or from a marketing perspective, we call it first, 
then the marketing person has completed his or her job and they move the the person to become sales qualified lead. Now, why the sale marketing person does not make it directly an opportunity? Because no one in the company should decide to change a lead into an opportunity except salespeople. Okay, so we're going to talk now later on about if you are businesses entirely marketing, how do we do that? So yeah, we do it automatically through lead scores, but we will see more about this. But this pipeline is generic and it assumes your business is into marketing and sales. So then after they uh, change the person's uh, the lead from being a marketing qualified lead becomes a sales qualified lead. Okay, and then the, the conversation ends up by saying, yeah, so please expect a call from one of our sales, uh, you know, uh, representatives. Uh, thanks. I hope you have a lovely day, blah, blah, blah. They close the line. And then very important, they change the status here into a sales qualified lead. And then the person who is assigned to call this person is so much uh, in the automation and they get a notification and they, of course, they must meet the deadline. If we promise the customer tomorrow five o'clock, you'll get a, a call. This person tomorrow five o'clock must call the person. This is one of the greatest uh, issues make companies is they promise because sometimes when you promise, if you tell someone I'm going to meeting you tomorrow at five o'clock, this is an opportunity for you and a curse. It's an opportunity is if you go five o'clock, exactly. But it's a curse is if you miss it. So you gave the promise. You gave yourself an opportunity and you put yourself in trouble if you don't meet what you have promised. This is why you find some companies which is also ugly. Yeah. Thank you for contacting us. Please expect one of our salespeople to reach to you soon because they don't have a system. They don't have automation. They don't know when one salesperson is going to call the guy. You know, and they say, so, yeah, 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 I will wait. They close the line. And look how much difference it will be when you close a call by saying someone will call you soon or later on. Okay, the person might close and say, yeah, this might not call me. So they go and continue shopping for a solution. But uh, yeah, so this is very important about, about business. And what can make your company uh, be able to give such promises is, is automation and technology. If you have a good marketing solution or a good sales solution within your company, CRM solution. Now, when it comes to the salesperson at this stage here, we refer to it as a sales qualified lead. All right. And here where the salespeople will speak uh, or handle the uh, lead. And you remember the example I gave about cars here. They try to qualify it to, to see whether it becomes opportunity or not. When it becomes opportunity, of course, they give quotation to the clients. They engage here. So the entire thing here is engagement once people. So once the prospect visit and submit a form or they interact with you, this entire thing is uh, from here, which is until opportunity is closed are the engagement part in the four stages of the customer life cycle. And then when the guy buys becomes a customer, right? After that, of course, we don't manage retention here, but after the customer becomes here at the retention stage. All right. So let's analyze this pipeline from this perspective. Hmm? You can see, uh, you know, those two stages here, all right, prospect and marketing are the responsibility of marketing people. So if you are into marketing in a company and they ask you, what is your role? You are being an interview with a company you are joining. What is the role of a marketing person? The role of a marketing person is to, to the, the execution part of marketing is to identify the buyers based on the personas. This means the entire marketing strategy comes in here and then target and rich prospects and generate marketing qualified leads and hand them to the salespeople, right? So if you are not giving enough leads to the salespeople, you are not doing well as marketing. So your job is not only brand awareness. Your, your job is to do brand awareness so that you can generate marketing qualified leads and hand those leads to the salespeople within your organization. Sales responsibility is to take those marketing qualified leads, push them forward so that you can get revenue inside your organization. This is why the compensation should be, or the target setting for the marketing people is how many leads they have generated. Uh, and the reward for the salespeople are simply the sales commissions they receive. 
which can be percentage of the revenue. It depends on the business. You have to have uh, rewards for the marketing and sales people. But marketing people are rarely or not, they are not paid at all commissions based on the total. But if you want to align them completely, nothing prevents you from taking certain percentages and sp- and splitting it, not equally, of course, on sales and marketing. It depends on on, on your setup. Conclusion is the entire field of reward and recognition is key for you to drive uh, incentives and to drive commitment from from people, right? Now, so this is why when we plan for the funnel, as we mentioned, uh, we have to have enough uh, leads, obvious, so that we can have enough business. So this is why it is a completely a joint uh, relationship between the marketing and the sales. In this uh, slide, I speak about uh, uh, marketing-driven businesses versus sales-driven businesses. Some businesses are run entirely as marketing uh, and some are mainly running uh, mainly as sales. So if you are into wealth management, uh, you notice uh, those people are maybe 95% sales-driven. So they don't. They refuse to send even emails to to people with the products, etc. They try to arrange direct meetings. So they try to close deals by directly engaging with uh, with their uh, clients. Okay, but when it is marketing driven, assume in a business where it's completely marketing driven. In this case, uh, how does the sales pipeline will go? Very similar, by the way, but we depend more on automation. So this is why marketing automation is is more suitable for marketing driven businesses. And it goes like this, you know, you have a marketing uh, automation solution, which we will cover in part two of the course. And then you identify your uh, buyer's personas, you target your prospects, and then you will have leads. All this is attracted inside your marketing system. And then this entire movement between marketing, the sales driven, etc., they can be merged into two stages here is into one. So once a lead has become a lead, you assign to the lead uh, uh, a lead score. And that uh, score gets pushed up and down based on the interactions with the with the lead. So I hope this is makes it clear how you manage your marketing and sales uh, and the plan for them uh, in the case of you are a marketing driven or if you are into sales driven. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, try to uh, conclude a little bit uh, this chapter and uh, focus on two important principles. Uh, I think I, I mentioned uh, some of them during the previous slides. Marketing and sales alignment starts by defining uh, the marketing and the sales process, which should clearly state the responsibility uh, and targets of each team. It's outside the subject here, but if we speak about organizational culture, what kind of culture is suitable for marketing and salespeople? Is it teamwork? The answer is no. <laughs> you want them to compete with each other and you want them to see that it is the survival of the fittest. So this is why uh, sales people have to work in the silos. So you are completely focused. You know, uh, if you are supposed to help your colleague as a part of being employee, because this is a part of your organization's values. But at the end of the day, your survival and the company and you being rewarded and promoted is based on your performance. And if you're salespeople, what's your key performance? Money. Then the marketing team is responsible for lead generation, as I mentioned, and the salespeople are responsible for revenue. So marketing KPIs are about the number of leads, as I mentioned, and the sales key performance indicators are about the revenue targets versus actual. All right. So if we are going to be meeting, if, we're gonna, if, we're, if a salesperson is responsible to do $1 million in a year, and then they split it into different periods. Every quarter is a quarter of a million. And then how much are we, uh, you know, actual versus target? If you are in quarter one, end of quarter one, the person, if it is equally spread, which is also not right because in every business there is seasonality. So this is why in, in sales, in assigning sales target, we plug in the figures normally on monthly basis or quarter basis based on previous year uh, targets as well or, or actual performance. Great. Now, when we speak about the four stages of the customer life cycle, marketing is responsible for brand awareness. 
Okay, and customer engagement, where is sales are responsible for customer engagement and conversion. So you see here the overlapping. Of course, at the end of the day, they need to work as, as a team uh, and uh, avoid having your marketing and sales fight with each other like it is the case in many organizations. Wow, by this I finish and looking forward to the next chapter, which is going to be about the fundamentals of marketing, strategic planning, a very important chapter. Next time, uh, okay, where I will be talking about how to plan and develop your entire marketing strategy within your organization. I hope you enjoyed this video and please, please uh, don't forget to like, uh, because when you if you like the videos when you click on the like uh, you tell the algorithm in youtube uh, show this video to other people as well so please click on like and uh, you may uh, send me emails at ask at imatshukay.com or visit my website uh, com. if you want to become my patreon please uh, it will be uh, highly appreciated go to patreon.com slash Thank you for watching this chapter and looking forward to meeting you in the next chapter uh, within a few days from now. Uh, hopefully I will take uh, two to three days uh, to uh, complete the recording and the editing of the next chapter, chapter six. Bye-bye.